Good morning. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about joint work with Anne Broadbent and Gus Gutowski on quantum one-time programs. So suppose we have a fixed public function f. A one-time program for f would allow for secure, non-interactive, two-party computation of the function f. The sender has a private input x, which inputs into some program or device for the function f. She sends the program to the receiver, who then inputs his own private input y. The one-time program should output the value of the function f evaluated at x and y, and then self-destruct. In other words, it can't be used for any additional operations. Now, there are several motivations for one-time programs. I'm going to give you a few examples uh, that might be familiar to those in the audience that grew up in the 1980s. Uh, if you remember, Inspector Gadget uh, famously received messages from his boss that would self-destruct in five seconds. And a one-time program would allow us to do that using digital information. Uh, secondly, uh, there were these series of books, Choose Your Own Adventure Books, where as you were reading, you had to make a choice on which part of the story to go to next. And a one-time program would prevent uh, malicious children from flipping back to try for a different ending. <laughs> uh, but more seriously, uh, some applications from traditional cryptography would include electronic cache, uh, software copy protection, and digital rights management. The problem, of course, is that information can be copied. So if a receiver obtains a piece of software implementing a one-time program, then the receiver can simply make a copy of that program and execute it twice. As a result, one-time programs are impossible in the plain quantum model, sorry, in the plain classical model, meaning without additional, comp without additional assumptions. And that holds even if we allow computational assumptions. One possibility in the classical setting is to use hardware tokens, some physical assumption. And so a simple hardware assumption that we can make is that of a one-time memory, which is like a serialization of an oblivious transfer. Here, the sender has two inputs, S0 and S1, which she inputs into this one-time memory. She sends the one-time memory to the receiver, who inputs his own choice, I, and receives the output, SI. Subsequently, the one-time memory uh, dissolves or is rendered unusable again and can't be obtained, the receiver can't obtain the other output. One-time memories are compelling in the cryptographic literature uh, because they're fairly generic objects and can, and can be used and constructed independent of the protocol or the inputs that are used by the parties. And so they could be mass produced and distributed in advance and then just used in a variety of different protocols. So, if we have one-time memories, how can we construct one-time programs from them? In other words, we'd like a compiler that can transform a public function f and the sender's input x into a one-time program. A one-time program would consist of some software and these one-time memories. So the first work in this area was presented at Crypto in 2008 um, and gave a computationally secure construction for one-time memories for one-time programs using string one-time memories. Then a couple years later at TCC, a protocol was given that provided statistical UC security in the bit one-time memory model. So using one-time memories that only needed to store single bits. When we move to the quantum setting, several twists arise. So first, there's the no cloning theorem, which you might recall says that an unknown quantum state can't be copied, uh, and this rules out the basic copying attack that we saw before. And so we might wonder then um, if one-time programs are possible using quantum information. Second, one-time programs for quantum channels would need to handle entangled inputs. So we can have a sender and a receiver who have a joint entangled input state A and B. And so we want our one-time programs for quantum channels to both be correct and secure when the senders and receiver have entangled inputs. So in our paper, we investigate this question of how quantum information impacts one-time programs. So the first question we look at is whether quantum information allows us to construct one-time programs for classical functions in the plain quantum model. So intuitively, uh, one might hope that measurement would cause the quantum state to collapse and render the program incapable of being run twice. Unfortunately, that's not the case, and we show that uh, it's not possible to construct quantum one-time programs 
for classical functions for all but a trivial class of functions. We can also ask a similar question for quantum channels rather than classical functions. And again, we find that the case is no for all but a trivial class of channels. And I'll explain what this trivial class is in a few minutes. OK, so we know that we can't create one-time programs using quantum information uh, without additional assumptions. Um, so we might ask if quantum channels exist, sorry, if quantum one-time programs exist for quantum channels using bit one-time memories, like was used for classical one-time programs. And here we give a, a protocol that achieves this for all channels with statistical UC security. Um, our main techniques are a new quantum authentication code and a method for computing unauthenticated data using that authentication code. I'll just mention a few related cryptographic tasks. Uh, so there's software copy protection, uh, where we aim to allow a program to be executed multiple times, but still not be able to be split or copied into separate parts that allow separate execution. Like one-time programs, this is impossible using just classical information, although one-time programs themselves would provide a solution. There's some initial work on one-time uh, software copy protection in the quantum model, but general software copy protection using quantum assumptions uh, is still an open question after this work. Uh, another related task is program obfuscation, where we hope to allow a program to be executed multiple times, but where the, the code of the program still doesn't allow for the adversary to learn any information beyond what can be learned from running the program. Um, and again, we know this is impossible with classical information alone. One-time programs would provide a solution with a bounded number of executions, um, but it remains an open question uh, whether this is possible in general in the plain quantum model. So now we'll move into our uh, results. So our first result is our impossibility result, uh, that quantum one-time programs are not possible in the plain quantum model, except for some trivial cases. So let me begin by explaining the trivial case for a classical function. So here's a, a function we might want to execute. We have the function f of xy equals x plus y. So from one perspective, this is a function that should never have a one-time program, because a receiver can learn everything about x using a single input y. But from another perspective, this is a function that has a trivial but secure one-time program. And here the one-time program would be that the sender simply reveals x. And then the receiver can execute the program using x. And I say that this is, quote, secure, because a single query to f will also reveal x. So in other words, the adversary doesn't learn anything more about the function then he, sorry, he doesn't learn anything more about the sender's input than he could learn from running the program. So this is a, a kind of class of trivial, uh, a class of functions that have trivial one-time programs. And so in, in the classical setting, we can characterize this set. So we say that a function f is unlockable if there exists some key input and a recovery algorithm that allows computation of the function for any sender, for any receiver input. And it is exactly these unlockable functions that have secure, but as we saw before, trivial one-time programs in the plane model. In particular, we can show that if a function is unlockable, then it has a secure one-time program. And correspondingly, if a function has a secure one-time program, then, it's then the function is unlockable. And so this completely characterizes the class of functions that have one-time programs. Now we'll move to the quantum setting. And I'll first need to introduce a little bit of notation for talking about a quantum one-time program. We have a public channel phi, which the parties aim to evaluate two inputs on. Their inputs are rho equals a and b, which are the sender and receiver's input. There's an encoding operation which creates a program for the sender's input. This program state p is sent to the receiver, who runs it through some decoding operation to obtain an output. So the security of a one-time program is defined by comparing the real-world execution of the protocol with an ideal functionality. In the real world, the sender prepares a program state based on our input and sends it to the receiver. The protocol is secure if there exists a simulator that can recreate the program state for the receiver with the quantum, sorry, with the senders, without the sender's input, but using a single call to an ideal channel implementing sorry, an ideal functionality implementing the channel. And so uh, the definition that we give in the paper is in the UC framework. 
Um, for simplicity, I'll just focus on the perfect case, but the results hold for statistical and computational indistinguishability as well. Now, in the quantum setting, similar to the case for classical functions, we, we can say that a quantum channel is unlockable if there exists some key state and a recovery algorithm or recovery channel that allows computation of the correct output for any input. If we have a function that's unlockable, then we can show that this is a function that has a secure quantum one-time program in the plain quantum model. And conversely, if a function, sorry, if a channel has a secure one-time program in the plane model, then it's unlockable. And again, this completely characterizes the class of channels uh, in terms of their ability to have one-time programs. I'll just make a brief comment that this is a, a tighter result than in the proceedings version. In the proceedings version, we had a slight gap between the class of unlockable and not unlockable channels, uh, but we've since been able to close that. Okay. Now, I'll move on to our, our central result, which is the possibility result. And this says that it's possible to construct one-time pr programs for channels using classical one-time memories. Uh, perhaps slightly surprising in, the in this result is that the one-time memories only need to be classical. They don't need to store quantum bits. So now let me give you an overview of our construction. The main idea is to encode a program state in a tamper-proof way that still allows some computation. So the quantum one-time program will include the sender's input and some auxiliary qubits encoded in a tamper-proof way, which still allows the receiver to perform gates on the encoded data. As long as the receiver does the operations he's supposed to, he'll be able to recover the output at the end. Our two main tools are quantum authentication codes and a mechanism for quantum computing on authenticated data. So the quantum authentication codes will provide the tamper-proof encoding. And here, using a classical key, we encode the data using authentication code, which will detect tampering with high probability. An important difference between authentication in the quantum and classical settings is that quantumly, in order to authenticate data, you also have to encrypt it. So this actually helps us when it comes to confidentiality. Second, we need a method for quantum computing on authenticated data. So this is a way of performing gates on these authenticated and encrypted values. Normally, quantum computation on authenticated data requires interaction between the sender and the receiver, uh, but we'll substitute that with the classical UC secure one-time programs that uh, we've seen from previous work. For the quantum authentication codes, we use a scheme in which a data qubit is encoded using error correcting code and then encrypted using random polys. So conveniently, these poly encryption schemes map an arbitrary attack into a mixture of poly attacks, which is called the poly twirl. And the short story is that from a practical perspective, we only need a family of codes that's secure against poly attacks. And these are a bit simpler to construct. So in particular, we introduced something called the trap authentication code, which is built on self-dual CSS codes. And here we encode a single data qubit row using a CSS code into n physical qubits. Then we add some trap registers, three n trap registers in the computational basis, and sorry, n trap registers in the computational basis and n trap registers in the diagonal basis. Then these are all permuted using a random permutation pi and the result uh, is our authenticated data. And so we can show that this family of trap codes is secure against poly attacks. Um, I'll point out that these trap codes have actually been used before. Uh, they're implicitly used by Shore and Preskill in their original proof of QKD security uh, in 2000. Um, but this is the first formalization of the authentication properties of these codes. Uh, now, the one, once we have the authentication code, we need a method for performing gates on the authenticated data. And to do so, we turn to techniques from fault-tolerant quantum computation. Um, there have been a couple of other works on quantum com computation on authenticated data, another of which is quite suitable for application, but I won't be able to go into the details of those here. In order to achieve uh, quantum computation on authenticated data, we need to exhibit a series of gadgets that allow for universal uh, computation. So we need a gadget for measuring, um, and here we can measure our logical qubits by measuring our physical qubits and then, provide, uh, then applying some qu classical decoding. To perform polygates is actually quite simple. We don't have to have the receiver do any physical operation. We just need to update the encryption key uh, that is stored classically. A CNOT is also quite simpler. 
quite simple. There is some CNOTs required on the encoded data, followed by some simple poly key updates. Rotation gates are a bit more complicated. So they make use of an auxiliary or a magic state uh, which has been prepared by the sender and sent along for helping out with the computation. And then after a operation on the magic state and the measurement is done, we need some one-way communication uh, between the sender and the receiver to update the keys. And again, we'll do this using the one-time programs that have been serialized into one-time memories. And then finally, Hadamar gates can also be applied uh, using magic states um, in a technique similar to gate teleportation. Um, now that we have a way of doing computation on authenticated data, we also need to provide a mechanism for the receiver to get his input and output uh, into and out of the program. And we can do that in a similar way using gate teleportation. Uh, this allows us to teleport the input and output through the authentication and deauthentication circuits. So I can finally state our protocol for quantum one-time programs. Uh, for a public channel phi, the sender prepares a one-time program consisting of her input encoded, with some mass encoded using the quantum authentication code, along with some magic states, some encoding and decoding gadgets, and some classical one-time programs that implement the classical communication for the computation on authenticated data. Now for the receiver to use the quantum one-time program, he teleports his input through the encoding gadget, performs the target circuit using the various gadgets for quantum computation on authenticated data, teleports his output back through the decoding gadget, and uh, he's done. And all of the classical communication that's required to do this operations and gadgets uh, is done via the classical one-time programs. To show security, we need to construct a simulator that can emulate a correct one quantum one-time program without access to the sender's input and just using a single call to the ideal functionality. So the key idea is that the simulator prepares a fake quantum one-time program that's mostly the same as the original one, but with a special encoding gadget. And the encoding gadget allows the simulator to extract the, sender's, sorry, the receiver's input using teleportation. Then the simulator can put that into the one-time program, sorry, into the ideal functionality, and then teleport the result back into the encoding gadget. And uh, so after that, the simulator just continues the protocol as in the real world um, and just has to do some careful work to ensure the same output occurs in the real world and the ideal setting. Um, and in the end, we can show that the final states held in both cases, in the real world and the ideal world, are close in trace distance. And our proof applies actually to any encode, encrypt, and con authentication scheme that admits computing unauthenticated data. So to wrap up, um, in this paper, uh, we've investigated whether one-time programs are possible using quantum information. And so first we found that quantum information doesn't actually allow for quantum one-time programs of either classical functions or quantum channels in the plane model, meaning without hardware assumptions, except for a class of trivial unlockable functions. And second, we've shown a UC secure protocol for quantum one-time programs for quantum channels in the classical bit one-time memory model. And to do so, we've used a new authentication code called the TRAP scheme and a method for computing on that authenticated data. Thank you very much.